In this section we're going to discuss the Smart Stack Functional Global. We're going to see how we can expand the functionality of a functional global beyond the typical initialize, stack, and use, or initialize, read, and write. The particular example we're going to investigate is the circular buffer. This is an example where we want to keep a certain amount of data in memory, but when we exceed the length of our memory we want the newest data to overwrite the oldest data. This is a very efficient data structure as we'll see, and it's a very practical one can be used very often in real-life applications where, for example, we need to acquire data when a certain trigger event occurs, whether that's a voltage level, a digital input, or the pressing of a button on a computer screen. However, unlike typical triggered acquisition, we need to acquire the few seconds of data before the event occurred. In order to do that, we must always be acquiring data. We must always have a continuous acquisition, and we must use something like the circular buffer to store this information. Let's talk about how the circular buffer behaves. The circular buffer, as mentioned, is a functional global. In its initialization stage, an array of numeric data is created. This is this array we see right here. It's been predetermined to be of a fixed length, and even though it's empty, the array is still created. We'll see this as we go through the code. The following is the behavior of the circular buffer as data is placed into it. In this first stage here, the blue data blocks are added into the buffer. In this case, the start of the array is here, so the blue data gets inserted and occupies these blocks as one would expect. The next time data is inserted, it's this pink data. So in this case, there's only four pieces of data added. Again, the data is inserted, but this time the data starts when the previous block ended. So as we see here, the pink data gets inserted right after the end of the blue data. There's a piece of information here, which we're calling the pointer. The purpose of the pointer is to store the next available buffer position. So we saw here when we first stacked the blue data, the pointer was at the first element, and so the blue data started there. After we stacked that, the pointer was moved to the next available empty block, and thus when we added the pink data, that's where it appeared. The next step, we're going to add five blocks of data. That's this green data. Now, now we have a problem. We see that we only have two blocks available in our circular buffer. However, we have five pieces of data to insert. The way that this works is, because it's a circular buffer, the two oldest pieces of data get inserted here, and the three remaining pieces of data go back and overwrite the three oldest blocks of the blue data. In this way we can see as data keeps getting added it's going to eventually replace all of the blue data and then the pink data and ultimately replace the green data. The only other piece of information which we need to store is a boolean which tells us whether or not the buffer is full. As we go through the code, we're going to see why that's necessary. When we initialize the buffer, we set the full to be false. In other words, it's not full. Every time we add data, we make a decision based on whether or not we had to split the data and insert it at the beginning of the buffer. If we did, then the buffer is set to full. Once the buffer is full, then the buffer flag, or the buffer boolean, remains full until the data is initialized again. In this way, we can continuously add data into our buffer, and we will never fill the array. We'll merely start overwriting the array. The other important point here is that we're not extending the length of the buffer when too much data comes in to fit. The reason for this is that extending the size of an array within LabVIEW is actually a very expensive action. In other words, it takes a lot of memory and processor resources to expand an array. A very typical approach to this type of problem, instead of using something like a circular buffer, is to use the build array function and continuously add data onto the end of an array. In this way, the array will get larger and larger and larger whenever new data is put on. As many people will have experienced, it turns out that this is a very inefficient way to store data. The result quite often is running out of memory or crashing the computer because when data is collecting for minutes and minutes and minutes or hours or days, eventually the memory gets filled. Using an approach such as the circular buffer as we see here, 
ensures that that will never happen. The downside, of course, is that we can overwrite older data. But the positive side is that we can be sure that our data collection will be efficient and consistent and will be stable. Before we proceed and investigate the details behind the Circular Buffer VI, let's take a look at an example which uses it so that we can see from a high level the purpose of the Circular Buffer VI. What we have here is a very similar example to the one which we just created in the last section, where before we were storing the scale factor into a functional global. Now, instead of storing a scale factor, we're actually storing the entire generated array of data into a circular buffer. So again, we have the structure where we're using our functional global. It has an action input. It has a data input. It has a data output. It also has, as an additional input, a buffer size. Let's first look at the initialization step here. We know because we have two sequence structures with a wire connecting between them that this portion of the code is going to execute first, and this is where we perform our initialization. Here we call the initialize action of the circular buffer. And here we specify a buffer size of 500. This is telling me to create a circular buffer with 500 elements. Next, we have two parallel loops which run here. The second is generating data. Here we see 10 random numbers are being generated using a for loop. That array of data is being added to the circular buffer. So again, we're storing data, but we're storing arrays of data at a time. This is equivalent to adding one block of data, as we saw here, at a time. In the top loop, this is where we handle user interface events. For example, the value change on the stop will stop the top loop, and of course the local variable in the second loop will be read and will stop the second loop at the same time. Also, and even more importantly, we have a timeout event handled here. What the timeout event does is retrieve the data that's in the circular buffer and place it in our waveform graph. As opposed to the previous example where we were replacing one data point at a time into a chart, this is a waveform graph displaying an array of data at one time. If we go ahead and run this VI, we're going to observe the behavior. See how data is being added? We go from point 0 to 200 or 300. And ultimately, when we get to the point 0 to 499, we see that new data is no longer being added. Instead, the oldest data is being removed, and as we can see here, the graph is essentially scrolling. In other words, the oldest data is being overwritten, and the newest data is being placed at the right-hand side of this plot. And when we stop it, of course, both loops stop. Let's run this VI again so that we can observe the behavior prior to the circular buffer being full. See how our data is growing and growing until eventually it hits 500 points, and then newest data is overwriting the oldest data. In the full version of the LabVIEW Mastery Intermediate course, at this stage we talk about in great detail the VI which stores the circular buffer information. In addition, the VI is provided for you to use freely in your own applications.